Hello, welcome to today's class. Today we will be talking about the concept of ocean salinity. Now, oceans are a huge body of water, but despite of water being everywhere, you cannot find that water potable. Potable means drinkable. The reason being, the ocean water has excessive salinity. That's why there is a famous rhyme of the ancient Narayana that says, Water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. Now, this salinity, if we find out about the ocean itself, we say around 50 quadrillion tons of salt is present in the ocean water. That means it's around 50 million million tons of salt that is present in the ocean. Now, because of the salts that are present in the ocean, the ocean water is not potable or drinkable. This salt comes through various sources. So it's very important to understand where the salts come from. Now salts come from land. From the land you have deposits that flow into the ocean body. So you have salt coming in from there. Then you have water streams through which the salts flow into the main river, the river is drained into the ocean. So you have salts coming in from the streams or the rivers. Then you have underwater, underwater or I should say undersea volcanoes. So these undersea volcanoes erupt and when they erupt, they bring out a lot of elements, they are mainly in the form of um, salts. So you have magnesium and calcium salts that are usually coming out. So you have undersea or underwater volcanoes that is one of the primary reasons for the salt in the ocean bodies. Now there is a primary question to understand here is, the rivers that drain into the ocean bring a lot of calcium but the ocean bodies have a lot of chloride. How does this happen? Now the rivers or the streams when they flow into the ocean body, they break in calcium chloride. Now this calcium chloride, the calcium separates out and is found in deposits in mollusks or diatoms. Okay? And the chloride is left behind. This chloride turns out to be the major cause for the salinity in the oceans. And it's estimated that this chloride is nearly 46 times the chloride that is present in the rivers. So you can understand how the rivers that are flowing in does not have that much of content of salinity but the oceans have a huge content of Salinity. The reason being, the calcium that is coming in from the rivers or the streams get deposited and the chloride is left behind and this chloride leads to the sole, re is the sole reason for higher salinity in the oceans as compared to rivers or water bodies. Now, we are, we are talking about salinity. So, how do we calculate salinity? What was the first standard method that was used to calculate the salinity? And what is average salinity? Now, when we are talking about salinity in various terms, we first uh, let's first understand the concept of salinity was brought by William Dittmar, and he carried out an expedition which was known as HMS Challenger, conducted by the Royal Society of Britain, and this is considered as the longest ocean investigation which took around four years and under that investigation they covered around 68,980 nautical miles of ocean. There were 77 samples that were taken and by these 77 samples 
the average was calculated and in 1884 William Dittmar calculated the average salinity of the ocean bodies to be 35 parts per thousand. So with there would be 35 grams of salt in every thousand uh, grams of the uh, every thousand elements present in the ocean. So this was the average salinity that was calculated, and I'm explaining you how it was calculated. Now this average salinity varies from region to region. The region of Black Sea has higher salt content as compared to a open ocean body. So there are various factors that affect salinity. Now there is another scale which is known as PSU or the Practical Standard Scale, a Practical Salinity Scale that was used to calculate the ocean salinity and that talks about the conductivity ratio of a sample of a given sample of potassium chloride and 15 degrees Celsius in 1 kg of the solution and that comes again similar to 35 PSU. So we can say that the average ocean salinity is 35 PSU. Now there are various numerous factors that affect salinity. If there is higher evaporation, what would happen is a lot of salts would remain below. So higher evaporation leads to increase in salinity. So that is one of the factors. If the precipitation or the rainfall is more, that would lead to dilution of the salt contents and that would decrease the salinity. If the precipitation is high, I can say there would be less of salinity. The river water and melt water, if the river water inflow or the melt water inflow is more, so that inflow will lead to decrease in salinity. But over the period of time, as we mentioned, that the calcium chloride that is coming in through the river or the melting water would leave calcium as deposits and there would be slow and gradual increase in chloride which would eventually lead the uh, which will eventually lead to increase in the salinity of the oceans. Now atmospheric pressure is another factor that affects salinity. So a higher pressure would affect the salinity. Then you have wind direction. If the winds are blowing away then that would affect the salinity and there would be a cause of increasing the salinity. Then the movement of seawater. Under this we will talk about the thermohaline circulations. So we will talk about thermohaline circulations. Now we have already introduced this concept in the previous class where we have talked about ocean temperatures. So the word thermo here means temperature and haline as we are studying this topic refers to the salinity. So these circulations are governed by both temperature and salinity. So we will be studying this topic in detail. Um, then you have the location and the characteristics of the sea. If the sea is a kind of inland sea, the salinity would increase because it is an enclosed sea. So there is no outlet or no inflow of waters as such. So that would lead to increase in salinity. Now in the previous class on ocean temperature, we have already talked about a concept which is known as brine rejection. Now this brine rejection takes place in the polar regions and what happens is, I will just do a quick recap of what we discussed in the previous class. So brine rejection, what happens is, you have over the poles you have deposits of ice and in that you have bubbles of, uh, for, uh, bubbles of brine which are high in salinity as a result their freezing point is low as compared to the remaining ice. So the remaining ice you have a freezing temperature of 0 degree and for this region you have a negative freezing temperature. As a result this region remains in liquid state as compared to the remaining ice body and slowly and gradually this liquid percolates downwards okay and you have salt that moves out from the freezing area, frozen area and it slowly goes to the remaining sides. Okay? So you have poles with low salinity and a higher salinity in the adjoining regions. So that is one of the concept of brine salinity that is also studied under salinity. Now let's talk about how the calcium that is extracted from the rivers is deposited. So as I previously mentioned, you have 
rivers that are draining into the ocean body and these rivers are bringing in calcium chloride. So what is happening is the calcium is being deposited under mollusks. It is used by mollusks as deposits or diatoms and these are deposited. What happens is the chloride remains and this chloride reacts with sodium and NaCl is the main proportion in the ocean and this contributes to higher salinity. So you have NaCl as the main uh, salt content, then you have calcium chloride and magnesium chloride as the minor contents that are found into the uh, ocean and that cause to that cause the salinity. Now we will talk about some other elements or sea lives, how they deal with or deposit the various elements. So as we can see, lobsters, they use copper and cobalt and deposit it. Snails secrete lead. You have sea cucumbers that secrete vanadium and you have sponges and seaweeds that remove iodine. So there is a lot of role of the sea lives that affect the salinity into the ocean body and we will see how the salinity gets stronger. So as we see, you have, as we go deeper into the ocean, so this, is, this shows the ocean depth. So as we go deeper into the ocean, you have the water salinity that slowly and gradually increases. Okay. And this, uh, while we studied the thermobilized population, it was a kind of reverse phenomena. So you have the uh, thermocline and then you have the halocline. This halocline is a line that talks about the salinity. So in this we have talked about how the salinity increases as we go deeper into the ocean. One of the reasons is, reasons is the brine rejection that occurs in the polar region and then again sea life that affects the uh, the circulation and the content of water. Now this is a video that I have taken from NASA and this explains the thermoanalytic circulation. So we will just go through this video and we will try to understand how thermoanalytic circulation takes place. Now before I start this video, let me first explain thermoanalytic circulation in brief. So these thermoanalytic circulations as we previously said are result of two phenomena that is temperature and salinity. So you have temperature and salinity that affect the density gradient. So these lead to density gradient and this density gradient is the sole cause. Okay? This density gradient is the sole cause of the circulation as per the thermoaline circulation. Now this thermoaline circulation is also known as the great conveyor belt. Now what happens is, when I start the video, just go through it and you will see the Americas here. The dark region shows denser areas and the light region shows less dense area. What is happening is, the water is going up from the girls' stream, that's the warm water that touches the green land and slowly this water comes down here okay, and it goes down as the North Atlantic Drift and this region because of this is totally ice free. Now what happens is slowly and gradually this water goes down and this same flow of the water is maintaining in the southern regions around 60 degrees south. And when we move here around the 60 degrees south, you have the South American region and the South African region. And you can see this belt of warm water is maintained. And you have circulations that are constantly going through. So you have warm water that goes up near the North American region. Okay, That's through the Gulf Stream that creates the regions of uh, North America cold. And then finally you have the circulation that is maintained in the whole of the ocean body and this is a common belt or we can say it's a kind of great conveyor belt that covers all the waters of the world. 
So I'll just repeat it again here. Since this video is not still, I can explain you better. So regions of North America, what happens is, you have built a stream that moves upward. That is the warm current that is going upwards. And under this region, you have Greenland, you have North American region. If the warm current goes there, and slowly you have the cold current that goes through the other waters. So you have the warm current that goes through as an overwater, and then you have North Atlantic drift that moves through as an underwater current, and that is a kind of cold water, and this is a kind of warm water. So there is a kind of balance that is being maintained in the whole of the ocean body, and this warm current keeps this region of North America and Greenland completely ice free year the, uh, down the year I would say okay and this current then goes down okay and this circulation is maintained here okay so this is a common belt or a common ocean circulation that is being running from the above surfaces of the water going to the below surfaces of the water. So from the poles you have all the saline water that is flowing down by the cold currents getting into the tropical region and finally moving further down. So this is how the thermoaline circulation or the DNC works. So in this class we have talked about what is salinity, why oceans are more saline than river waters, how does salinity originate, what are the factors that affect salinity? And finally, we have talked about the thermoaline circulations. We will be talking about waves and currents of the ocean in the further classes. Till then.